meant means that will you please repeat what you said in 2005. So I said that's good because that's going to save me a lot of time. <laughs> because then I don't have to prepare too many lectures. Anyway, the, the main thrust of what I am trying to say <clears throat> is that is a big fundamental contradiction between what we do in the schooling system and the demands of children, the natural demands of children. They're too, like, you know, they're not even, you know, uh, like in railway train parallel tracks. They have two different directions. And everybody acknowledges this. It's not that teachers are dumb. Teachers are the ones who see this problem first time. In the USA, what they do, they call it a disease. They call it the ADS, Attention Deficit Syndrome. And they plug the guys with drugs. Because they don't know how to deal with the energy of kids who are being stimulated so much that they want to do something. And the last thing that any kid likes to do, and what you are doing now, and what you have done for the last 25 years of your life, is just sitting on a stool and listening to a person like that. I mean, imagine that they got no other recourse. They can't flail about with their arms, with their legs. They can't, they, they, they got a tape on their mouths. Because the, the current notion of education is that it takes place in silence. You must be silent. Only when you are silent will some learning take place. And he is really a prisoner in that room. You can't get out of that room. And he can't get rid of this tyrant who is sitting there and watching whatever he does, rewarding things and punishing certain types of behavior. And what is the way of rewarding? Control over their grades. For the moment, you are too much of a troublemaker. We ensure that your grades are bad so that your parents come and everybody else comes and joins the gang and begins to mourn. Now, for a youngster, a kid who is 6 years old or 7 years old or 10 years old, you can imagine what the world must be like and how he is looking at this structure, this could be, because as I said, he can't, he can't make any choices about this. It's not given to him. You can't tell a child, no, no, you walk out of school and you do whatever you want, you walk on the street, you do whatever. A lot of children do it. A lot of straight children, for example, in India, huge number of them on the streets. Not because they don't want to learn, and not because they're not learning. They're all learning. They are better than the guys in school. Even at the age of 5, 6, 7, 10, they're already earning some income. Remember the old David, David Copperfield movie, Oliver? They're already making some income because their brains, they are they're, they're, they're like all kids. They're, their minds are quick and fast. And nobody can dispute that anymore after the arrival of the mobile phone. The mobile phone, if you give a mobile phone, take the latest model, you give it to a six-year-old guy and you give it to a 55-year-old professor, then you know what the capacity of learning is. You know, they don't need to prove it, there's nothing. You can just see abject, crippled individual. He will know only two and then he will probably not be able to find out where the keys are, he takes and that's only if they have to do only one function. <laughs> While well, the, these, these other guys have discovered 12, 15, and the other guys come to you and say, please, how do you work this thing? Because these guys are fine. Because their minds are working at super speed. They are being stimulated all the time. Their body is like sponge. It's just absorbing all these sorts of things that are happening. All the time. And this is, if you look at it, is the remarkable way in which children learn language. Children don't lang learn language with ABCD and syntax. That's the only the foolish way of studying language. And that's what we do in school. But children learn language through sound. Sound. Sound is a primary medium through which children learn. That is the mother's sounds, the father's sounds then repetition of that sound and after two to three years they are able to speak very very difficult languages 
whether it's Chinese or Telugu or Tamil or whatever it is, they're able to learn how to speak very, very difficult languages. Sometimes one and a half year, sometimes within two years, and they have mastered it in such a way they can talk to anybody in that particular language. And, as I, I, and the capability of kids for languages is enormous. They can learn three, four, five languages. In India, I was giving last time an example there. They can literally learn if they are in South India, they will learn three languages. Because their father will be Kandra, their mother will be from Andhra, learning Telugu, and their grandparents will be from Tamil Nadu. So the, all the three families are talking to the child. And the child picks up no problem. Where has the child ever said, language is too difficult for me to learn? But here, with all the testing, with all the syntax, with the brushing, with the A in all the stupid nursery rhymes from England, <laughs> Jack and Jill went up the hill and all that. Despite that, at the age of four to ten years of schooling, our people still can't speak English. So this is the disparity between the way people learn naturally and the way people learn in school. And I'm not trying to disparage the way people learn in school. I'm only saying that we have reached a stage where we are going to re-examine this whole institution of the school and see whether we can telescope the entire learning of the school into the time required. So anybody who wants to pass a higher secondary examination in India knows what, what he has to do. He plays the whole year and in the last three weeks he marks and he has to do the exam. Exams are that easy that you are fool if you are going to spend more than three weeks trying to do any of those exams. They are very simple to do. They follow and they have gone now to the lowest common denominator. Because politicians don't like people failing. So now in India, for example, you, you cannot fail anybody up, up to the age seven. Means we have got no exams. Even the exam will fail. Till you complete seven, until you reach the age. Nobody can be kept back as a failure. It's not, it's not anything else. But they don't want to convey the message to the child that he or she is a failure. In so up to that time, exams banned everything out, out of the room. Actually, exams should be out permanently for our lives, but I don't know why we can carry on with them all the time. And we submit to them. I don't know why we submit to them. We don't, we don't rebel against them because we have all gone through the schooling system and we have all acquired the mindset. And therefore, as a great heritage of mankind, we are willing to give it to the next generation intact as the great wisdom from whatever text that you want. This is the way we look at all the received wisdom. The fact is, all the received wisdom that you have learned, all the history and all the geography and all the civics and all the social science can all be safely chucked out of the window and you will not lose a single bit of your education. Why? Because most people have forgotten everything that they learned. Forgotten everything. Where in some part of Africa some people are digging for some zinc and some, somebody else is you know, some steel plants in Pakistan or some textile mills in some way. All that rubbish that we were told to, 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 to do school, we diligently went through it because as teachers we felt that that is what the system wants us to do. And we have to examine, re-examine our students from that. So but the result is the conflict is bound to emerge because the teachers and the administration have got one set of goals and the children have got a different set of goals. And that conflict is not resolved in any formal system. It's not been resolved. Because a formal system does not believe that it should be challenged. It believes that it's God's wisdom. That the way to bring up children is to put them in a box like this. A bare box like this. And some of the boxes are even worse. I mean, there's my name at least, so I should feel a bit pleased about it. And there's some, some color, and there's some, some, some sort of you know, you would say something to this room, but you know, some of our village schools don't even have that. They are really dreary dungeons, no lights, no toilets. We have a very interesting experiment going on in, in the state of Tamil Nadu, it's a very huge state in, in South India, where they have introduced what is known as activity-based learning. I think many of you may be familiar with activity-based learning. At least one compensation in activity-based learning is that the teacher is not standing up there as the agent of the system wanting to see that nobody makes any trouble and everybody behaves properly. The teacher is eliminated and all the children are made to sit around in groups and do things that they want to do. 
<laughs> now you would say this is a tremendous transformation because authority is removed and the whole learning situation environment is changed. But even there I can tell you, when I went to visit some of these authority, ABL schools, I found that after about 15 minutes somebody would get up and want to go to a toilet. And then there would be somebody else going to the toilet. And I said, let me go and see what's interesting about this toilet. Because this toilet seems to be even more interesting than even whatever they have done. So I went down and I found most of the students in the outside the toilet having a good discussion, laughing, doing whatever children normally like to do. Now the toilet is the dirtiest place in the school and the stinkiest, if you know Indian toilet. <laughs> Despite that, the children were making a very clear declaration that being in that toilet was still better than <laughs> 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 the Now if you, if you are observant, when you say that you should be observant, <coughs> why don't teachers observe this? Why don't they observe, why don't they see that something is going wrong or something has gone wrong? And how does one eventually try and get this back? How does one get children to once more imagine things? And you see, they can't imagine things because there's no time for them to imagine it. Because they've got to go through the syllabus, the teacher will say, I've got to finish the syllabus. And the grading of the teacher will be, if there's geek and hours or there's any other thing, how many successful students, how many people have understood, what are those grades there and all that, and so it goes on and on. There's a reinforcing system right up to the top. So you can't blame teachers. Teachers are employees. They may be committed teachers, they may be committed teachers who have taken up a job because they needed a job, but whatever it is, they're still employees. I don't know of any teacher who can say that, I'm damn the administration, I'm going to do what I have to do. That's still not permissible. And that's the only reason why guys like me come sometimes to discuss with, uh, with uh, the Beacon House, because at least this is the only institution which has at least got its mind open. Whether they are able to do anything after, I don't know. But at least they have their minds open, and I can tell you, you couldn't organize a conference like this in India, or in London, or in Malaysia. It's not possible. There it is like a block. God, you can't challenge, you can't change. And all that you can do is more. So all that the committees and I'll say, how much more can be dumped on these kids to make them walk around with the rest of the world, what is happening, so that they are more educated. And it's a terrific, terrific slot.